There are people in this world that are born different. These people could differ in varying ways. Sometimes they may have a stronger immune system, increased visual acuity, or accelerated muscle growth. However, sometimes these differences can be extreme. Like in the case of Ashley Brown, a high school girl from Alaska. In my line of work, it is best to never let the subjects know you know what they can do. In most cases, this is easy since the top athletes aren't aware of their genetic advantage and the top academics still have to study and put in the work. But in the case of Ashley, I was compromised from day one. I was staring down an alpha-level psychic, trying to convince her I am just her guidance counselor. I know she knows everything, but what can I do? Ashley, I shake while trying to get the words out. I think enough is enough. Why don't you go back to class and we can revisit this tomorrow? All I can do is hope that... Hope that she doesn't want to hurt me. Why would you think that, Martin? My heart nearly stopped as she spoke my thoughts. My gun is in the drawer. Would that be enough? Not nearly, she hissed. Ancient Martin Adler, I know you aren't really here to discuss college applications. Fuck, I gotta go for it. Every muscle I have is getting tight. I can still move, but just barely. Is this her? Yes, Martin, it is me. You know, I thought your name was Eric Coster. I know the life they gave you. You've been here for, what, six years now? You have a wife and a little boy that goes here. Ashley, if you want to cut the shit, fine. But let me tell you now, you can kill me, brainwash me, turn my mind to mush, but we know about you. We know everything there is to know about you. If you kill me, the entire weight of the United States government will rain a hellfire on you. There will be nowhere you can go that they won't find you. Nowhere where you can go that they can't destroy you. Her grin seemed so haunting to me. Why is it so disturbing to me? I can answer that, Martin. You see, you never made it to Alaska. In fact, you made it about as far as any other agents did. Right now, you are in a hospital in Washington, breathing and eating through tubes. All the information you think you gathered is just things I wanted you to know. Like how you think my name is Ashley Brown, from Anchorage, Alaska. It's funny, because the other agents think I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, or even from Whitehorse in the Yukon. Some of them think I'm a little red-headed girl, and some think I'm an overweight neckbeard gamer named Elliot. It can be exhausting at times. Fuck you, Ashley, I barked. You can't expect me to believe that you are that physically powerful. You are creating multiple psychic links that power a unique universe that each agent resides in, all while hiding from the agency? No. I refuse to believe it. That's bullshit. She gets up from her chair and places her hands on my desk. I can give you everything you've ever wanted, Martin, or I can take it all away. You choose. I pull my gun from my desk and I pull the trigger. In the second it took for the bullet to pierce her skull, everything changed. I was standing there with a revolver, having just shot my wife. You got one thing right, Martin. I was lying. I'm not that strong. And this is all very, very real.
in the year 2004. There were several reports from the state of Alaska and nearby areas in Canada of a being, seemingly a woman, that would cause people to become submissive, those who would seem to be the toughest, strongest person in an area more than others, and then force them to terminate the lives of loved ones and then themselves. It seems that the creature also had the ability to, on command, only be visible to certain people, along with being able to teleport. However, at the scene of the murders, it always seems that the only wound of the submissive man or woman, visible at first sight, seems to be on the neck. However, once an autopsy is complete, it always seems that there are internal wounds, such as gunshots, with no remains within the body aside from the final wounds. In one instance, it seems a survivor did witness the figure, who she described as a dirty blonde, long-haired, pale white woman in her early 20s, with a white fox-like mask, with a white cloak, with gray flowers spread on said cloak. Interesting enough, it seems that in the months before the murders began, in surrounding towns, there seemed to be a white cat with pale green heart-like shapes above its eyes that would sit in one spot for hours on end. If the being evolved from the creature, it is hard to say. The case has not been solved, with murders seemingly ending altogether in April 2005. However, some private investigators believe the murders may have continued all the way up to December of 2012 along the West Coast. I once knew a man, more specifically a young adult, who would brag constantly about his ability to drink like a fish. He bragged and boasted his ability to down whole handles of vodka every night, yes, even on weekdays, and was content to know that no one could outdrink him. His main source of conversation amongst peers was just that, drinking. That last weekend he couldn't remember, and blacking out. We all felt sorry for his inability to control his addiction, but nothing could be done. When he didn't get his fix, he would lose it. He punched holes into walls, smashed his appliances, and even threatened to kill one of us if we didn't get him a pack of natties from the store in his time of need. Ultimately, the story cut short there, as he got killed by a pack of wolves on his brief fishing trip in Alaska. The wolves were found walking unevenly and falling over just a few hundred yards away from the body, as there was so much liquor inside the victim's body, they themselves felt the consequences after they consumed the corpse. Three, two, one. The low grinding turned back into the familiar whir of the AC. Mom always said to take a breath and count down from three. It would always come back on. She promised. Thomas was crying, his tidy whitey soaked in sweat, as his tiny four-year-old frame hugged the concrete floor of their darkened basement, lit only by the flashlight in Derek's hand. A wave of sizzling heat was blasting them again, snaking through every crack and crevice in the house, while the AC was struggling to do its job. These air conditioners are good for 300,000 hours. They have to replace them for free if they stop working before 34 years are up. Mama tried to reassure her boys as the ticker on CNN continued to climb. 
the number of heat-related deaths rapidly rising as day after day of record-breaking temperatures bore down upon them. Rolling blackouts left so many vulnerable to the heat, and where once 134 degrees Fahrenheit was a record-breaking global temperature, it had now been the local temperature in places as far north as Juneau, Alaska. After a month of this, death rates were in the millions, according to television and the internet. Ice sheets had all but melted, billions of gallons a day, flooding entire cities off the map. At this point, Derek was pretty sure the human death toll was in the billions, but the internet had shut down completely a few days ago. A catchy jingle on an infomercial had been enough for Mom to use all of her savings for Solar Central Air, which was run on specialized solar panels. It was a genius idea when temperatures had been in the 110s. But the creators hadn't anticipated the dust. Field after field, street after street, baked in the heat, death everywhere. Plants, animals, humans, whose bodies it was too dangerous to move. Sour death rent the air. Dirt gusted around in heated winds, coating the solar panels, blocking them, bleeding the stored energy that much faster. Mom had gone to attempt to sweep the panels hours ago. She always went in the early morning, just before the sun came up. She would have had just a few minutes before the roof became too hot, too dangerous to stand on, before her hands and feet would have blistered despite the fact she wore gloves and thick shoes. She would have been back by now. Derek squeezed his eyes shut, not wanting to look at his little brother, not wanting to consider what would be left of him when the A.C. stopped altogether what his tiny skeleton would look like, shriveled up on a steaming concrete floor. The grinding began again. The system surged and lurched and struggled to turn back on. Deep breath. Three, two, one. The grinding continued. Lower now. The heat trickled in. Three, Two. One. Sputtering. It had to come back. Mom promised. Three. Two. One. Our research team first found the creatures we grew to call Nesserons off the northwestern coast of the United States, just below Alaska. They were the top predator in the ocean. They had no natural predators, and we had never even seen one before. Hell, I could pull that. We know more about the moon than the oceans, shit that everyone does. But this really proved it. We had a predatory fish, just a bit larger than a blue whale, living right under our noses. Once we began really looking, using the bait they liked, sperm whales, we found them in every ocean on the planet. We even found a few in the barren cold waters around both the Arctic Circle and near the coast of Antarctica. The world was shocked when we discovered that they could generate electrical pulses, like an electric eel, that's how they caught their prey, stun and then attack. Perfect plan, perfect predator. A new king at the top of the food chain. We even noted that they would ignore humans, perhaps out of fear. What earlier civilizations would have called sea monsters, we were calling gentle giants. This was groundbreaking. Until we found a half-eaten corpse of one. 
washed up on a beach in Washington State. <laughs>